on to the sixth session. So um, this is it. Uh, and it's been so really, really, really wonderful having so many of you come on and for us to chat. So to get right in, um, there's a packed schedule today. We're going to just go into Hillary, but here's uh, just a quick recap of what happened. Well, I just wanted to say how much I've learned from these six weeks, just as much as you. Uh, I've learned a whole lot. And on the first week, I learned that meditation, Christian meditation, is a form of prayer. I think that stuck with me. It's a prayer of the heart. And I remembered, and I now pay attention in Mass when I hear the words, lift up your hearts. So therefore, I took away from that first week the desire to lift up my heart to the Lord whenever I am praying the Christian meditation. And also, it is within that book, that famous book, Cloud of Unknowing. And then on the second session, I learned about John Main and how he rediscovered Christian meditation and how we've always had a long history within the Catholic Church, uh, within Christianity, uh, of persons rediscovering Christian meditation. And I think these six weeks have been for all of us a rediscovery. Uh, of Christian meditation. We are discovering a new, but we are rediscovering it. And then on the third week, we saw all of the history of persons that we are belong to a long history of persons who went before us and who all discovered it, rediscovered it, especially, and we, we featured the Desert Fathers in Egypt, but we came forward with Mr. Eckhart, Mr. Eckhart, and Thomas Merton, and then John Mean, and Lawrence Freeman. So we saw that we belong to a long history and we have ancestors. And then on that, was that the fourth week, we learned about the Wheel of Prayer. And just so happened that this week I was telling Sandy, I discovered that this Wheel of Prayer, all of these prayers lead towards the center. And what struck me in the liturgy on Sunday was with the words, through him, with him, and in him, in unity with the Holy Spirit, all praise and honor is yours, Almighty Father. And I felt that connected me with this wheel of prayer, that in the liturgy, in Christian meditation, uh, we find that connection with the Holy Spirit, with the Trinity that resides within. And all of those different prayers that we went to lead towards the central point. And then last week, the fifth week, I learned, and Sandy has been reminding me that I have to leave myself behind. Uh, that is the smallest self, but, which is Sandy had, those of us who were here last week, remember that, that big elephant she had, uh, the elephant in the room, which is the ego, that you have to let it go. And that Christian meditation allows you to, to let go of the elephant gently so that you can become who you really meant to be, a reflection of Jesus Christ in the world today. Very good. A plus. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> so today we're going on to the, our final session and we're going to be talking about the fruits and benefits of meditation. Um, so, you know, a lot of times we ask, well, why do we meditate? What is it? What are we getting out of it? And, and we live in a world where we need to know that we're getting something out of it. So today we're going to talk a little bit about the fruits of meditation, the fruits of the spirit, and what are some of the benefits of meditation. So I want to start a little bit to, to, to roll back a little bit because I think um, we need to give some context to, to what we're talking about uh, so, for, so that we'd understand a little more clearly when we come to the benefits of meditation. So um, you'd learn that there are three common types of meditation. So now, you know, once something becomes a buzzword, they have all kinds of meditation all over, all over. And in researching this, um, this week, so I went onto the NHS site, um, which is a site on, in London. And they have meditation now. So meditation is a big thing now in London as well, you know, in the NHS. And they have all kinds of transcendental and all kinds of meditation. But the three common types of meditation that we want to uh, talk about is the focused attention meditation, which is a Christian meditation that we do, mindful meditation and compassionate 
and loving kindness meditation, which is the Buddhist practice. So I just want to go through very quickly what these are about, and it will help us. It will help put some context when we come on to talk about the benefits of meditation. So compassion and uh, compassion um, and loving kindness meditation. So the Buddhist meditation is. Uh, usually associated with mindfulness and awareness and there are a lot more forms of buddhist meditation than we think of but they all have mindfulness as the common denominator so for example you would be doing um buddhist meditation and they would say um may you be happy may you be well may you be safe may you be peaceful and at ease may i be happy may i be well may i be safe may the world be happy and they you know and so and uh, but all of it uh, is mindful they have mindfulness as their common denominator when they do that uh, as well and then uh, there is mindfulness, uh, uh, mindful meditation. So in mindful meditation, and I know we must have touched on this a little bit before, in mindful meditation, we pay attention to the activity of the mind in a non-judgmental way and become the impartial witness of what we experience. So what we, you calmly notice the body sensations of breathing out and breathing in. So pretty much just like we did at the start of the meditation, you become aware of your body and try to quiet your body. And uh, the person who got involved with this, John Kabat-Zinn, he recognized, uh, he's worldwide recognized for the gold standard in mindfulness uh, training. And he actually learned meditation from the Buddhist tradition. But of course, he couldn't take it into the secular world unless he left all the spiritual benefits. So um, but what um, he realizes is that contemplative practices needed to be adapted so they can effectively serve and transform the hearts and minds of people in modern culture. So he, he just removed the spiritual part of it, that part that we focus on as Christian meditators. And so and um and he took it into the secular world and it's very, really very very big now in the secular world um so you find that they teach it i ha actually teach um when i teach at, at log so we have one of the courses we do is meditation and leadership and uh, you know so the universities are teaching it in the business world i'm sure judy could tell you um, that she teaches it as well. We teach one of our, um, when we when we do training as well, one of the areas we teach is meditation. And well, I teach Christian meditation, but I teach you know, you're mindful or Christian or whatever, you know. But um, Lawrence Freeman, he's, he once said that mindfulness opened the door through which it has failed to walk. But it is us who have faith, who have the faith a practice Oh, sorry, I'm reading this all wrong here. Yeah. It says mindfulness open the door through which it has failed to walk, but it gives us who have the faith, a practice and opportunity to walk through that door. So it prepares us, it prepares us, but when we actually do our meditation, it takes us to the end. So mindful meditation would be the early part of our meditation where we just stay calm and, and so and become mindful of the your body, mindful of the breeze, mindful of the sounds, being mindful of all these things. And then uh, in Christian meditation, you take it just one step further where um, you recognize that it's uh, the prayer of the heart. Uh, and so once we calm our bodies and we can focus on our breath and our mantra, and then we stay there with that uh, as well. So that's what, um, that's, that's the essential difference and the big difference really. And then there is focus attention meditation, which is the meditation that uh, we do as Christian meditators. Um, and it's the anchor for the attention. Meditation um, is the age old practice of focusing on a sacred word or phrase or a mantra. And this is repeated silently and interiorly during the time of meditation. Thoughts and images at this time are considered uh, like a distraction. And so when they come, we let them go, gently let them go. And I, and I say gently because I think it's so important to be gentle with ourselves uh, and then return the attention to the mantra. You know, uh, you meditate without ambition, without expectation, you accept what is happening um, and be grateful if nothing happens. Um, the essence is to be faithful to the practice. 
are not seeking special or altered states of consciousness and seeing stars and different colors and rainbows or anything else or you know just uh, nothing happens great you had a great meditation you know there were these two monks who were meditating in this story and they meditated for like about two hours which i could never do and then when they were finished um one of them asked the other did anything happen he said nope and then he said did anything happen with you and he said nope he said okay great we had a fantastic meditation and that's faith and that's the kind of uh, faithfulness to the practice that we're talking about you know i had a, a really and i hope the person doesn't mind me saying this i had a very interesting little uh, what's up conversation today so one of the participants she said um i i need to ask you something if i feel to you know if i'm itching and i need to scratch during the meditation what do i do you know and i told her i said scratch honey you know mm -hmm. you know because i think the important thing is that you need to understand to be gentle with yourself eventually you will get to the place uh, you know where you can be peaceful eventually you will get to that place but if you're not there at this moment uh, it's a journey and uh, we're we're journeying to that space so so um I just wanted to go through that a little bit so, so that we could, um, you know, um, put it in context when we come to the um, benefits of meditation and the fruits of meditation. So on to the fruits. In Christian meditation, it's about being grounded in God's presence and being aware that something is happening within us at a level that is deeper than ordinary self-consciousness. We can't, we cannot describe it in words, but it's something that is happening deep inside of us. And fruits is a good word to describe what is happening when you meditate, because the good heart that grows naturally in us is a result of regular meditation. That good heart that just gradually, gradually grows in us, you know, um, is like a seed planted in the ground. It germinates and it starts to grow in stages. It eventually gets flowers and then fruits and then seeds and then the cycle keeps going. So the fruits of meditation are naturally part of the process of spiritual growth. And this is very important for us to remember. You know, um, I, at our meditation group uh, this week, uh, one of the persons who was present, and she's present here tonight as well, she was saying, you know, um, my journey started and uh, I didn't realize, uh, you know, I started, I met Sister Ruth and I started meditating and uh, then I came and I started in this group and gradually I found my behavior started to change, my attitude started to change and just just very gently, I'm, I found that I was becoming a lot more loving, a lot more caring, and so, and the gentleness with which it happened was something, you know, and, uh, and this is particularly important for us to remember, because many of us think virtue of being good in terms of our will. We think we have to overcome negative things by willpower, and being good has to be, you know, forced, but you know, willpower by itself won't bring about much spiritual enlightenment. So, yes, we need willpower and everything, but it's not going to achieve that uh, liberty of spirit. And that's why it's important to trust uh, the naturalness of growth in spiritual development. And it's one of the big lessons I learned in my life, in my own spirituality. <laughs> I need to be gentle with myself and gentle with my spirituality and gentle with my, you know, um, uh, my, in, in some of my journey has been challenging and learning to, to, to question God, to, uh, you know, to talk to God, to ask God, you know, and be gentle with my spirituality and not, and not anesthetize myself or, or force myself or will myself into it. But just to be still and, and, and let God do his work in you because his Holy Spirit is in us. And so, you know, just let God do his work in you and just be open and just be present, practicing presence, just be present and allow him to gently, gently do the work in you. Yeah. And notice how much of it is about natural growth 
you know, in Jesus' parables, uh, he talks so much about seeds planted in the ground, vines that grow. The seeds of this, these seeds are already within us as part of our essential nature. And this is what we are naturally. We are essentially nice people. We are naturally good people, you know, and we have to believe that and believe that about ourselves and just allow God to do his work. So, so it's a combination of faith and, and grace. And grace is about that mysterious presence of the energy of love. Some of this, yeah, the energy um, of God in our lives, which is never far away. You know, so we can't, we can forget or ignore that, but we, we need to always remember, you know, to come back to it. We forget, we ignore, we whatever, but always he's still there. He doesn't go away. So the fruits of the of meditation, the fruits of the spirit cannot be seen as an egotistical kind of self-fulfillment. It's not, your ego is not going to do it for you. You know, um, God has to do it for you. Um, yeah, the, the fruits of meditation are less easy to measure and can best be understood in terms of becoming less self this is somebody is, uh, let me just mute, mute um, okay yeah there was a, a noise coming out and it was it was distracting. distracting. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so what we're saying is our lives will change naturally as the fruits appear. You know, it's like, and I, I love that I use this pawpaw growing because, uh, you know, I'm on one of the Facebook pages, Trini Farmers, and there's this guy, he said, I am looking at these pawpaws on my tree and they're just not ripening. They've been there forever and they're not ripening. You know, and uh, um, the pop is one of my favorite fruits as well. And I was laughing because while I was reading it, I bought a pop in the supermarket and I bought a nice big green, you know, with the lines which they tell you should buy it with. And so, and I'm looking at the pop all week and the pop is just not ripening at all. And every day I look at it, I wrap it in uh, cloth. cloth, I wrap it in paper, do all kinds of things, researching, and so, and the pop is just taking its time to ripe, you know, and then this guy shows up on Trini, and, and he says, you know, when do I pick this pop it's, And then, you know, it's allowing, allowing it to happen naturally, and our lives change naturally as the fruits appear. Yeah, it yeah. Could be anxious. Yeah. So just like the, the gentleman with the tree, you get nervous, you get anxious, you say nothing is happening, I'm meditating all this time and, and nothing is happening, I'm not seeing any any ripening of fruit. But you have to be patient, changes are taking place, the pawpaw is maturing. But you know what I found? I found the secret is not about getting, but it's about letting go. It's about letting go. It's about emptying ourselves to live a more spacious life. And I love that saying. You know, it's about really letting go, letting go and emptying yourself so that you could live a more spacious life in um, the fruits. So the fruits um, of the, the harvest of the spirit in the New Testament, we don't find consumer spirituality. It's not about obey these rules and you will get everything you want. What we find there and at the heart of all true spirituality is the commandment to simply love. And in that love, we are gifted with the fruits of the spirit, which are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, fidelity, gentleness, self-control. In meditation, we are sanctified because we are healed. And the source of our being is also the source that heals us and makes us whole. The fruits of the spirit grow gradually in us because we begin to turn to the power of love at the center of our being. Whatever happens in meditation happens at a level that is deeper than the ordinary self. So those are the fruits of meditation. So we just want to go on now to the benefits of meditation. When science meets meditation, and uh, you know, um, 
the, the fruits are so much lovelier. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. So the benefits of meditation, John Zabat said, now again, we bring back this name with Michael, this when he started over all these years ago, over 20 years ago, maybe even further back than that, started bringing mindfulness into the secular world and a lot of research a lot of scientific research has started happening and uh, over 20 years of research now have shown that meditation produces uh, significant changes in both the function and structure of the brain of experienced practitioners so these studies also demonstrate that contemplative practices can have a a, a really um meditation. substantive impact on the biological processes uh, critical for our physical health so meditation research provides new insights into methods of mental training that have the potential to enhance uh, the human health so here's what happens now so we have uh, um, scientific america one of the big science magazines uh, their front page in neuroscience of meditation um, then we had Harvard Business Review, the Harvard of all, you know, Harvard is the business school, and uh, they're talking about mindfulness, mindful meditation can literally change your brain. I remember what we talked about mindfulness uh, and what, um, what Father Lawrence uh, talked about mindfulness at the beginning, and then we continue into meditation after that. And then we have Google, which is a, a, a a, another big one. Um, Google now has a meditation chamber at their headquarters uh, and they offer a blueprint for office well being. So, well being now is, and Google has, I mean, if you visit their site and you see the fantastic meditation room that they have, and of course, everybody else is doing it as well. So, we have Apple, Google, all of these places, and meditation rooms are now the hottest new work books. You know that you're working you in a have, place. You have a meditation room in your office. Yeah, well, <laughs> I have a meditation room in my office now. Yeah, but you know, it's so it's become a big thing now. And what we find now, of course, is entered the school. So I just told you about our own local university teachers meditation. When I teach, I or I, I start all my classes, I turn off the lights and they meditate for five minutes. And the funny thing is you meet um, uh, students in the corridor and you think you've taught them all these very important things to succeed in life in the business world. And they meet you in the corridor and they say, oh, Mrs. Bangucci, we remember you. You're the one who taught us meditation. And that seems to be all they remember, really. And even in secondary schools, and I know Pat is here and she's going to tell us a little bit about it as well. But um, the, here we have a picture of Father Lawrence teaching meditation to secondary school students. And, uh, you know, so it's, and I know we have a program even in the COVID. primary school. Yeah, this is before <laughs> COVID. Yeah, after COVID is another thing, you know. And then also the health sector at Stanford um, Stanford Health Center as well. You can get, you can go, actually go on the site and find meditation online as well. So what we find is that there's so much, so much yes, happening it's, there. It's, it's a buzzword. It's a buzzword now, and uh, and, and it's because they have found so much benefit. So I'm not a medical person, and I know we have medical people on with us. Uh, so forgive my, um, my, my um, dumbing down of of the Simplicity. terms. Uh, but what um, what it does is, is the, um, I can't pronounce the word, but anyway, what happens is like if you play tennis a lot, uh, that part of your uh, arm is stronger. If you play the piano, your fingers get stronger. And so and then if you meditate, that part of your mind that, that brings you back to the present, back, back to what's happening now is strengthened. And so it causes a lot less stress in you. So the benefits of meditation can actually be arranged in four groups so, so the first is the brain performance benefits it improves attention it gives access to right brain thinking it optimizes brain performance in us um, the mental health benefits um, it reduces anxiety it improves depression reduces stress of living with chronic illnesses reduces risk prone behaviors and so and i'm sure um um, Simon, when he takes over, he's going to touch on this because he does a lot of work in this area as well. 
and we have the physical health benefits as well, positive impacts on stress-related conditions, lowers blood pressure. I know Hillary uses it uh, with his uh, blood pressure and it keeps his pressure down. Um, after he meditates, he always finds that it, his pressure is down and it boosts the immune system as well. And uh, um, some of the other psychological benefits, uh, it improves uh, emotional processes, it improves coping strategies, and it improves social functions. So that actually is uh, the end of my presentation. I um, said prefer the fruits. Yeah, the fruits, <laughs> over, the fruits <laughs> over the benefits. Yeah. So um, I am going to now stop on my slide share. So as we talked about here, the helps us and makes us whole fruits of the spirit grow gradually in us because we begin to turn to the power of love at the center of our being whatever happens in meditation happens at a level that is deeper than the ordinary self so those are the fruits of meditation so we just want to go on now to the benefits of meditation when science meets meditation and uh, you know um the, the fruits are so much lovelier <laughs> <laughs> you know but, so the benefits of meditation john zabatzin again we bring back this name with michael this when he started over all these years ago over 20 years ago maybe even further back than that he started bringing mindfulness into the secular world and a lot of research a lot of scientific research and so started happening and uh, over 20 years of research now have shown that meditation produces uh, significant changes in both the function and structure of the brain of experienced practitioners. So these studies also demonstrate that contemplative practices can have a, a, a really um, substantive yeah. impact on the biological processes uh, critical for our physical health. So meditation research provides new insights into methods of mental training that have the potential to enhance uh, the human health. So here's what happens now. So we have uh, um, Scientific America, one of the big science magazines, uh, their front page in neuroscience of meditation. Um, then we had Harvard Business Review, the Harvard of all, you know, Harvard is the business school and uh, they're talking about mindfulness, mindful meditation can literally change your brain. I remember what we talked about mindfulness uh, and what um, what Father Lawrence uh, talked about mindfulness is the beginning and then we continue into meditation after that. And then we have Google, which is a, a, a a, another big one. Um, Google now has a meditation chamber at their headquarters uh, and they offer a blueprint for office well being. So, well being now is, and Google has, I mean, if you visit their site and you see the fantastic meditation room that they have, and of course, everybody else is doing it as well. So, we have Apple, Google, all of these places, and meditation rooms are now the hottest new work perks. Uh, you know that you're working you in a have, place. You have a meditation room in your office. Yeah, well, <laughs> I have a meditation room in my office now. Yeah, but you know, it's so it's become a big thing now. And what we find now, of course, is entered the school. So I just told you about our own local university teachers meditation. When I teach, I oh, I, I start all my classes. I turn off the lights and they meditate for five minutes. And the funny thing is you meet um, uh, students in the corridor and you think you've taught them all these very important things to succeed in life in the business world. And they meet you in the corridor and they say, oh, Mrs. Banguche, we remember you. You're the one who taught us meditation. And that seems to be all they remember, really. And even in secondary schools, and I know Pat is here and she's going to tell us a little bit about it as well. But um, the, here we have a picture of Father Lawrence teaching meditation to secondary school students. And, uh, you know, so it's, and I know we have a program even in the COVID. primary school. Yeah, this is before <laughs> COVID. Yeah, after COVID is another thing, you know. And then also the health sector at Stanford, um, 
Sanford Health Center as well. You can get, you can actually go on the site and find meditation online as well. So what we find is that there's so much, so much yes. happening it's, there. It's, it's a buzzword. It's a buzzword now, and uh, and, and it's because they have found so much benefit. So I'm not a medical person, and I know we have medical people on with us. Uh, so forgive my um my my. Um, dumbing down of, of the Simplicity. terms, uh, but what um, what it does is, is the, um, I can't pronounce the word, but anyway, what happens is like if you play tennis a lot, uh, that part of your uh, arm is stronger. If you play the piano, your fingers get stronger. And so and then if you meditate, that part of your mind that, that brings you back to the present, back, back to what's happening now is strengthened. And so it causes a lot less stress in you. So the benefits of meditation can actually be arranged in four groups. So the first is the brain performance benefits. It improves attention, it gives access to right brain thinking, it optimizes brain performance in us, um, the mental health benefits, um, it reduces anxiety, it improves depression, reduces stress of living with chronic illnesses, reduces risk prone behaviors. And so, and I'm sure um, um, Simon, when he takes over, he's going to touch on this because he does a lot of work in this area as well. And we have the physical health benefits as well, positive impacts on stress related conditions, lowers blood pressure. I know Hillary uses it uh, with his uh, blood pressure and it keeps his pressure down. Um, after he meditates, he always finds that it, his pressure is down and it boosts the immune system as well. And uh, um, some of the other psychological benefits, uh, it improves uh, emotional processes, it improves coping strategies, and it improves uh, social functions. So that uh, actually is uh, the end of my presentation i um, said before the fruits yeah the fruits, <laughs> the fruits over the benefits yeah so um i am going to now stop my slide chair so as we talked about here the we talked about uh, the fruits and benefits of meditation and i'm going to stop here i'm going to stop sharing now and I'm going to look for Simon and spotlight him. And uh, um, Simon has been great. So Simon, you're on spotlight now. Yeah. And I'm going to hand over to Simon to share his uh, story with us. So Simon, over to you. Yes, um, Simon, you I need to unmute. unmute. He is he's still muted. Great. Good. You're up. Hearing hearing me now? Yes, yes, we are. Oh great. Thank you. Yes. Um my story goes back at least 30 years ago. Um, I remember in the early 90s at Living Water Community, having a gentleman come from the States to show us meditation. My only problem was in those days, I didn't read too much about meditation and I dabbled in it. So I would meditate and then I would have gaps in the meditation and this went on for years. I even um, at one stage did a little um, bit of meditation with the stentering group. And it wasn't until about eight to 10 years ago that I got involved with WCCM and Sister Ruth. And I truly started to invoke meditation into my day. Um, and I had the, um, the blessing of um, seeing Father Lawrence come to Trinidad on two occasions. But one, one occasion in particular um, stands out because um, we'd had a talk from him and there was question time. And um, one of the questions I raised with him was that, why is it that there were so few men doing meditation and so many more women? And I truly expected the, the normal stock answer, you know, that there's 
probably even more women going to praise and worship meetings, more women attending church activities. And that, you know, is the case. And therefore, that's why less men attend uh, meditation. But his answer to me was, what are you going to do about it? And that sort of bowled me over. I wasn't expecting that answer. But it set me thinking. And um, subsequent to that, um, I got together with a little group. And um, with Rhonda Ming was um, help and assistance from the Living Water community. We got the use of, the, of their conference room. And we started um, meditation. Maurice was one of the individuals involved. Um, you heard from Alvarez, but he came a little later. But we started with a very fledgling group of about six or seven. And that grew eventually to anywhere between 12 and 14 people doing meditation. And one of the other beautiful facts about meditation was we placed it on a Wednesday at six o'clock where the living water praise and worship meeting started at seven. So we would have our meditation. And then when we went by our way, at least five or six of the men would stay on for the praise and worship meeting. Um, I being one of them, Alvarez being another, and maybe four or five of us. Um, the only thing that has put a stop to it has been COVID. I am planning, hopefully, if there's not too much of a spike in COVID, I'm planning that um, in the near future, we will host at least one more meeting physically a month and continue to do as we've been doing for the last year, which is hosting um, the men's meetings every week by using WhatsApp. So I throw that out to the men who are watching the program here tonight. But if you're keen, you would like to get involved with men in men's meditation, the name is Simon Healy, and my telephone number is 678-0694. So you can give me a call and, and I can put you on the, the WhatsApp group and you'll get little bits of information on that um, WhatsApp chat from time to time if you're going to be hosting um, a full physical meeting. Besides that, um, I've been involved with others in starting um, a group at New Life Ministries. That's been running for a couple of years for the drug addicts that are, are going through their training up there to be, um, to be cured of their habit. And how we run that is one individual goes up every Wednesday at nine in the morning, um, does meditation with the men, um, maybe has a little chat on one of meditation components like love, faith, or joy, etc. And um, then a short period of meditation, no, no more than 15 minutes, sometimes in the, in the latter stages, 20 minutes. And that is run over three periods, um, a January to sort of end of March period, an end of April up to June, July, and a third period from September to December. And as I say, we have one individual coming per week. So um, the individual that helps run it only has to work once a month. Um, there again, if anybody is living in that area and is interested, it would be very nice if um, we could have help and instead of one person going up, if we could have an assistant going up with whoever is going up on that week. Um, so those are the two areas of, med of meditation that I am involved in. I also um, attend um, a meditation group that is run by Michelle um, for people who have been grieving over the loss of either a child or a spouse. And that is held once a month on a Friday evening. Um, and maybe, I don't know if Michelle is going to talk about it later, but um, 
that is a is a third form of meditation that I do attend. Um, as far as what meditation may have done for me, um, there's two two spokes that I'd like to highlight tonight. Um, the first spoke leading into the hub and the stillness of Christ is that spoke of little what I call ejaculations, little short prayers during the course of the day. So I have my morning prayer, evening prayer, but during the course of the day, I have found myself from time to time, you know, at a checkout desk in a grocery, rather than just saying thank you, saying to the cashier, blessings to you, praise be to the Lord. Um, I found myself in traffic jams, saying the prayer Maranatha, come Lord. I found myself at times um, looking for a street in Port of Spain and finding it difficult and having a meeting to attend. And suddenly the, the, the street name will pop up and I will say, oh, praise the Lord. And that to me keeps a connection between morning and evening and gives me a sense of knowing that the Lord is with me and holds me throughout the course of the day. And it's just short, as I say, short little um, Japanese prayers. Um, and a second spoke that I would like to speak to you all this evening about is I have found in, certainly in recent times, that the Lord has at times placed in my heart a message. And I want to give you a, an example of, of a case that happened to me over the last three or four months to exemplify what I'm saying. Um, back in October, I um, sensed that I wanted to have a blood test. No, no doctor said I should have a blood test. I just wanted a blood test. So I said about getting the blood test and having got the blood test, um, there's something else that I've been suffering from for years. I, I knew what it was, but it's never been fully diagnosed. And my lovely wife, Anne, has uh, somebody whose hair she does uh, at her salon, who has the same thing as I have. And she mentioned to, to Anne that there's a gentleman in Valsen living not too far from you who also suffers from it. So Anne told me of this, and um, I sort of put it on the back burner. Um, didn't do anything about it. And then about 10 days later, I'm in um, the, the big pharmacy in Extra Foods. And lo and behold, the gentleman is standing okay. in Pennywise. The, Lord, the gentleman is standing directly in front of me. So of course I asked him about it and he said, yes, he suffered from that. And I asked him, did he ever go to a doctor? And he said, yes. And I asked for the name and number. And I made arrangements to go and see that doctor. And there again, I got a, a sense of the Lord speaking to me, take the blood test with you. Even though you're going to a neurologist, you're not going to a hematologist, you're going to a neurologist, that's not his field, just take the blood test. So I went to see the doctor and yes, he um, very quickly um, diagnosed exactly what I knew already had. So um, I, I now, now had a full diagnosis of something that I always knew that I had. And I was about to leave his office and I said, doctor, could you look at this blood test for me? There again, another sense inside of me pointing me to bring this up. And the doctor himself said to me, he said, well, Simon, that's not my fee, but all right, let me have a look. And in looking at it, he was a little disturbed as a general practitioner. And he said, no, I want you to have some further tests. So I went for the further blood tests and coming back to him with the, the results. In fact, I think the results were sent to him direct. Um, he, he called me and he said, um, there's something a little serious here. I want you to see a hematologist. And there's one here in, in this building in St. Joseph. So that I did. And that arising from that, there were a battery of tests between the end, close, close to the end of November and early December. I had, God knows how many tests. And in the middle of all the tests, 
um, I had a seizure. So the doctors were concerned with the seizure related to the, the test that I was undergoing, which they proved was not the case. But arising out of all these tests, the rheumatologist um, told me that I'm suffering from something called smoldering, smoldering myeloma, which is a sort of precursor to myeloma. And now the treatment is I'm on medication to keep me in that realm of smoldering myeloma so that I would not you know, move into, into myeloma, which is a lot more serious. But I tell you all of that because I, I, I have been getting for quite some time, and that's a glaring example of it, I have been getting the sense of the Lord speaking to me at times. And I certainly put that down to, to you know, my meditation. Um, and I don't know if my wife wants to add anything, Anne, anything, did you see any change in me? Well, the change I see in Simon is that he is, I've always found him a bit of an anxious person. And I found with his, med with his meditation, he's not anxious again. And he seems to let things go and allow God to be in control of his life, much more the same way that you just told me. So that is a big plus in his life because I know Simon had an assignment to do something. It was panic, panic stage. He'd come in his little study room and that's it, don't even talk. But now he's able to let it go and allow God to really be part of that situation. And it takes all that stress off of him. And I know that it's because stressful lives create illness. So that is a very positive thing that I have seen him since over the years that he's been doing meditation. One of the things, as I said shared earlier, um, I've been able to you know, praise God on occasions when, when, when things are beneficial, when things go great. One thing I haven't been able to achieve, and um, we had a lecture recently at the Living Water Community from a, a well-known scriptural scholar who carries my name, she, she's an American. Her name is Dr. Mary, Mary Healy. And um, she spoke about the importance of praising God in times of trouble, in times of tribulation. And, um, in a Bible class that I'm giving, um, you know, I have many examples of that. And I think particularly the example of Daniel, um, where Daniel's um, companions were thrown into a fiery furnace and they spent their time praising God while in the furnace, and they were burnt. Uh, and there were many wars in the, in the Old Testament that changed completely because of the praising of God. So that is one area I would like to see an improvement in my life that I can say praise God over um, even this ailment that I currently have, because God is doing something powerful in the middle of it. Um, and one of the things that he did do was by me getting the seizure, I, 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 there again, I wondered why a seizure in the middle of all of this. And do you know what, what, what came to me from the Lord? Was that through the seizure, many, many people started praying for me, including a number of you. A number of you have been praying for me. A number of the living water people have been praying for me. And, and the Lord touched me and said, you know, you know, sometimes when, when you are struck with an ailment, you want to keep it quiet. You, you feel that it's, it's not something to share. And I've come around to the conclusion that that's not so. That um, people love praying for each other, love praying for you. And prayer is, is phenomenal. Prayer is, you know, moves mountains. So I have had umpteen people pray for me and during the course of the, the event in December, I could feel those prayers in a strong, strong way. Um, so, but that is pretty well what I wanted to share this evening, Sam. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Simon. That was so beautiful. Thank you so much. And it's so, you know, you started off saying the, about the men and, uh, uh, and what are you going to do about it? Well, I think uh, 
you have been doing a tremendous amount of work about it. So thank you so much. You. And uh, you know all the work you do with the men's ministry and uh, with the um, the addicts. Uh, and so thank you very much. You're truly assigned to our population. So we, yeah. So I think um, we need uh, more men like you in Trinidad, Simon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. So I'm going to hand over now to, uh, I'm going to go back to gallery view and look for Sister Ruth. Uh, there she is. So Sister, I'm just going to spotlight you and uh, hand the show to you. Yeah. Am I supposed to dance or sing? <laughs> it, was certainly, it was certainly helpful. <laughs> well, first of all, thanks again, Simon. And for all those who gave testimonies, every time I hear people speak about what meditation has done for them, it is, it is a very humbling experience because, you know, we are just facilitators. We get a gift. We see what meditation has done for us in our lives. And we have this urge to share it and very often, it, we, I, I'm amazed at what happens because I think we have to realize we are just instruments of God. We share the gift and the Holy Spirit takes over and she does her work. And so that I think what we have shared here and what Sandy and Hillary have shared over these weeks and all those who gave testimonies or those who worked in the background, it was a gift, a way of sharing the gift. Anybody who meditates is automatically a member of the world community for Christian meditation, and of course, part of our Caribbean community. So as we move forward and we say, well, what are we going to do with all these things that we have learned, the experience of meditation, we have to try to strengthen our own practice of meditation because that is what is going to anchor us. We have all these talks, these six week talks online on YouTube. Go back, look at it again and try to anchor yourself in the daily practice of meditation. We have done 10 minutes, try to take it to 20 minutes, try to take it to half an hour, try to integrate it into your daily life. If it's 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes in the evening. So go back again, don't let these things on, on Facebook or YouTube just disappear. Go back to it once a week, once a month and keep your practice anchored then you can share these same talks with other people. Send it to a friend. When you, you will begin to see meditation change your life, share it with others. Share it with somebody in your family. Let's look at the talk together. Let's look at the six talks together and see maybe we could start a little group in the family that to share meditation with our spouse, with our children. And then we can join a group. We have in Trinidad about 14 groups when we, before COVID, um, we are down to about eight now online, either on Zoom or WhatsApp. We're gonna put up a list of them on the, in the recording so that you can go back and check later on. Mm -hmm. I think meditation is a new call to us, especially in our confused and con world of conflict. It will help us to change our attitudes, our relationships. We have seen all this through the last six weeks. It will help us to leave ourselves behind and reach out to others. It will help us to understand the cross. It will help us to understand suffering. We have seen some of the fruits and benefits. The only way you will get the fruits and the benefits is by doing the practice. Like if you go to a doctor and he gives you medication, if you don't take the medication, it's not gonna help. If we want to be healed, 
if we want to change, if we want to deepen our relationship with God and with one another, we have to continue the practice. Um, before we get to the meditation center, we have some of the group leaders here with us. So I'm going to just ask a few of them briefly to talk a little bit about their group and um, also about work that they do with the community. And I'm going to start with Judy. So um, my group is based in Digo Martin when we face to face. It started at my home, um, went into the church at the invitation of Father Leo. And well, now that we are, we are virtual as a result of COVID, it's been in operation for about 18 years. It starts at seven o'clock because it's primarily a, a business community. So people from work, they come straight into it. I'm also actively involved in introducing meditation anywhere I see it's going to be of benefit. So I get calls from ministries in the, in, in the church um, to, to, to introduce meditation from schools. Um, Sister Ruth, as she was saying earlier on, we've gone up the islands introducing it to business communities, um, children who live in, children who are at risk, um, who live in homes, special homes, we, we've worked with them. In the business community, one of the things that is, if you read, especially during this COVID period now, is the importance of inner peace. They, they, they've identified inner peace as a critical competency for leaders. So at this point in time, you'll find a lot of, in the, within the corporate sector, there is a demand for programs that introduce the whole stillness. And that's how I would normally enter it in as stillness in order to facilitate the benefits that Hillary and, and Sandy just shared, because recognize that as the fruits of the spirit manifest themselves, it brings us to inner peace. And once there is inner peace, our relationships are better. If our relationships are better in the organization, we're less likely to take a day off because of it. So I, I introduce it initially as the silence and then recognizing that once you start becoming silent and you're doing that internal work, you become more self-aware and you become more grounded spiritually so that it is able to touch people of all religions as well as those with no religion because even atheists recognize that meditation is important. Unfortunately, the neuroscience has come along and is reinforcing, well, validating, I should say, what we've, what we've known all along, the benefits of, of meditation. So now for those who need to have statistics that, that validate it, that is around. So you can see that the, the numerous benefits, there actually, a, there's a list of 100 that I'll share with Sandy so she can share with you all as well, the 100 benefits of meditation. So that's just to say that, um, you know, meditation is really, they refer to it as a pearl of great price. And whenever I am impacted that something, personally impacted by something, I want to share it. And so anybody who knows me knows I'm always talking about any med meditation wherever I go. So anybody who speaks of anxiety or speaks about wanting to know God better, that's where you drop the pearl of great price. So I encourage all of you to tap into our groups and form your own group and, you know, just flourish in the gift of meditation. Great, thank you, Judy. Um, Pat is our coordinator for children and she'll tell you a little bit about her work with children and um, school. So I'm coordinator for schools and we uh, go to make appointments with schools for me, the principals and teachers um, introduce meditation to them. And uh, um, just like we did here, you, you explain what meditation is, you tell them the benefits, especially to children. And because children are natural contemplators, they are born contemplative, and we mess them up. <laughs> when we teach them meditation, you know, they are able to develop that contemplative um, spirituality. Um, and it really takes to it. So when I go to schools, especially maybe schools in more um, depressed areas, and they tell me how the children are so restless because they have a lot to deal with. 
um, in terms of the environment they, they live in. And sometimes coming to school, you know, it's really hard for them. They meet their bodies on the road and, um, or maybe the night before there was a police raid, et cetera. So they come very restless to school. And meditation helps them to um, calm and settle down and be more open to learning. And that is the main thing that with meditation. So a lot of principals report that after a period of meditation um, with the children, they have less discipline problems in the school. And they find children um, behave better and they take it home to um, their families, their brothers and sisters, their parents, so it spreads to the family. And of course, in terms of the schools, you have to do follow-up to ensure, well, to see if they have any problems, experiencing any problems, or maybe they'd like to go into a different area like um, with their exam students um, and that stress for exam, they want um, a special little talk for their exam classes. Okay, in addition to that, we also, I also um, work with WCCM International and they have now a meditation with children and young people. And we are trying to develop training programs for facilitators and for teachers, right? So um, that would help a great deal because um, I have, Two people who help me. One is Ann Smith. Um, she has in Central, and I was really appreciative of all the help she gave. And then Carolyn is helping me. What's happening in the East? This was all before COVID. All right. So, but we're looking forward and hope because we're developing training programs for both facilitators and teachers, and hopefully um, that'll make a big difference. And I hope that some of you who are listening and you're interested in schools, especially primary schools, the young children, you know, if we can get them meditating from an early age, um, it will make a difference not only to them, but to our nation later on. So says the Dalai Lama. He said, teach an eight-year-old child to um, let all eight-year-old children to meditate and we'll have a different will interface. So it's a 50-year plan. Okay. Um, Rhonda is somewhere around. I think she's going to just say a few words about the Living Water Group that she facilitates with Michelle on a Monday. Yes, I'm Rhonda, and I do assist Michelle, a young chief who's been a leader there uh, pre COVID. So we met at Living Water. It's mainly a ladies' group and comprises um, retirees and housewives for the most part. I'm one of the few persons working, but I have a little flexibility. So I was able to go to, to meeting and then go to work after. We have a WhatsApp group, so that's how we meet. And basically what we do is that we share readings before um, and after the meditation. And then we also have the opening prayer and closing prayer recorded. So those are sent on the WhatsApp group and uh, we will all just sit in our own Places and meet. Well, Zena's group is a, it's a new group for young women, most of the ages between 25 and 45, 20 and 45. Younger, younger women who they have different issues from us. Most of them are young mothers with one child or two children. So this group meets at the meditation center every Sunday afternoon at 430. It's a small group, so if anybody's interested, I have the information on the group list, so you can make contact and phone Zeno. Let me go on to a little bit about the Meditation Center. Um, very quickly, it's situated at 53 Pembroke Street. It's on the same compound as the Sisters' Residence and the Tea House, which is nearby. Um, it is open on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday from 10 o'clock until 2 p.m. It's a small center. There's a place for meditation. There's a small bookshop. And somebody is there to 
help you with medication. There are brochures, there are books for sale. So we welcome you to visit. Sometimes groups come up a few terms ago, the meditation group from San Fernando came down in a bus. We did a meditation center and then they had lunch at the tea house. And a lot of people come, come in like that. They go to the tea house, they order their lunch, they do meditation. So it's a way of bringing communities together. It's a quiet place in the middle of a busy city that you can come, there's parking on the compound. So you can come in to sit quietly or simply just read a book or whoever is there will meditate with you. And then maybe I should put you this morning from nine to 12, I am a member of the guiding board of the world community. And they have just set up, you see the beautiful picture of Bonvo. It's a center for peace that has been set up in France. It's about an hour from Paris. It's a meditation center of peace for the world. We are connected with it. Um, I have spent a few weeks there working with a young meditation community. Meditation there goes on four times a day. There's a work away um, project where young people from all parts of the world can go there um, to work in different areas of the center and they are given free board and lodge for seven or eight hours work a day and they meditate every day with the community. There's also a resident community in the Abbey and they will stay there as part of the central meditation group as a core community group promoting meditation. So Bondo, um, I don't think we are borders as luck. We can't really get out too much now, but I'm hoping to go back there to continue work with the community. Um, you're invited to go onto the Bondo website. It's written there, bondowccm.org. You will find there all sorts of events. There's a mass, a contemplative mass every Sunday, seven o'clock our time now. There is yoga online. There is a meditation online. So you can link with the international group by going onto that website and into the WCCM website where you will find loads of information. So especially during these COVID times when you have a little space, get onto that website and I think you'll be very happy there. So we go on next to after Bonvo to talk a little bit about a Benedictine oblate. And so we want to see about how we can keep in touch. Yes, um, Sandy, how to, we can keep in touch. We can keep in touch in a lot of ways. There, and we're leaving this on the recording so you can go back and check on it. There's a World Community for Christian Meditation, WCCM.org. There's also the WCCM Caribbean Facebook, where you will find all these talks that have been given. You will also find about 23 TV programs that we have done for Trinity TV. That is online. It keeps connection with the international community. And also, you have all the group leaders. If you have any problems, you want to join a group, you can get on and you can always call me. My email and mobile are there. If you want to start a group or join a group or get on to our community, know that you are part of the Caribbean community. You are part of the world community. So get in touch, keep in touch on that score. Let me go on to Michelle. Um, we also have a number of people who, after many um, weeks, months, years of meditation, begin to feel that they want to, do, to go on a deeper spiritual path. And there is what we call the oblate path, where you can become a Benedictine oblate. Um, I'm going to hand over to Michelle just to say a few words and to present some of the Benedictine Oblates that we have had, that we right now have. So Michelle.
Did you find Michelle? I'm looking for Michelle. I'm here. Yeah, okay. Michelle? So the, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, the oblate path. It's a way of entering more deeply into monastic wisdom, following the rule of St. Benedict with his tenets of stability, conversion, and obedience, which correlate with meditation practice as stillness, silence, and simplicity. The roots and the essential spirit of Christian monasticism is lay, meaning lay communities. And the Benedictine oblate path is a contemporary way rooted in the universal wisdom of the monastic tradition. John Main founded a new development of the monastic path for modern life, a committed contemplative life in a monastery without walls, which is what the World Community for Christian Meditation is or WCCM, it's a monastery without walls. What does this mean in day-to-day -day life? It's a commitment to twice daily practice of meditation each day in the tradition that John Main handed, handed on, participation in the daily prayer or office of the church as circumstances allow, especially in linking meditation to times of morning and evening prayer, a reading of the rule of St. Benedict each day, regular reading of scripture and wisdom texts, sharing in the life and work of the WCCM community, whose mission is to pass on the gift of meditation in the Christian tradition. The Oblate Path is basically a deeper commitment to a more contemplative way of life. Anyone can become an Oblate of the world community through three stages of discernment namely postulancy, novitiate, and full oblation. I am an oblate novice, and I have been since 2017. There is no fixed time to move from one stage to another. On the first Wednesday of the month at nine in the morning, I lead an oblate meditation group, which Sister Ruth currently hosts on Zoom. Anyone interested in this course of discernment can join our meetings simply by contacting Sister Ruth or myself. Thank you, Michelle. And um, some of the oblate novices are, are there on the photograph. Three, Carolyn, Sandy, and Pat were received online by Father Lawrence as novices. And Christine and Michelle have been in the, on the journey for a few years as well. So thank you, Michelle, and I say anybody who is interested in going a little deeper into the lifestyle of an integrated lifestyle with meditation can make contact with one of us. So that brings us to a little um, PR work. We have been organizing these sessions for the week. We haven't charged anything, but if anybody would like to help or to give a donation, um, I will ask Sandy to um, send across to everybody who is online. Uh, bank account, we have a WCCM bank account at Scotiabank in LSD Plaza. If you would like to give a donation, $10, $20, there's a lot easy transfer from bank to bank and from account to account. You can do that, or you can make a check to WCCM Caribbean and either drop it at the center or post it to 53 Pembroke Street. We'll send all that information on an email and we leave it to you to help to keep this program going we have expenses for the center. We have expenses for the schools. We don't usually charge them. So we have to keep, we have to keep it going and we need the help of the community. So as you can, if you can, we are grateful for him. So again, I thank you. And I want to show you, to, you know, that my prayer every day for our Caribbean community, for our Caribbean islands, 
And I think if we as a Caribbean community want to change our countries, want to change our own lives, want to make our countries a more patient, loving, faithful, kind place, the way to go is to share the gift of meditation. Because if each of us can display the fruits of meditation, our, all our violence, our conflict, our anger, all these things will fall out of our lives and we will fill our lives with the fruits of meditation and the, the gift of love. So thank you again and I hand over to Sandy and Hillary for the final word. So thank you all very, very much. And uh, you know, it was a pleasure doing it. Uh, and uh, I thank you for the opportunity to be here and to share with you. So we just end with our closing prayer. May this group be a true spiritual home for the seeker, a friend for the lonely, a guide for the confused. May those who pray here be strengthened by the Holy Spirit to serve all who come and to receive them as Christ himself. In the silence of this room, may all this suffering, violence, and confusion of the world encounter the power that will console, renew, and uplift the human spirit. May this silence be a power to open the hearts of men and women to the vision of God, and so to each other in love and peace, justice and human dignity. May the beauty of the divine life fill this group and the hearts of all who pray here with joyful hope. <coughs> May all who come here weighed down by the problems of humanity leave giving thanks for the wonder of human life. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. <laughs>